more. We're going to build web pages that are dynamic. Um, I want to build web pages that are dynamic. I've never done this before with students, and it's actually pretty easy and super cool where we can make multi-page websites that are like the same page acts differently depending on that URL. So we're going to be playing around with that. Okay, query strings in the URL. Uh, we're going to be using get and post methods today. Okay, um, I get just the get methods, but post methods will be coming next week. So those HTTP methods, okay, um, there's seven of them. Really, we're going to be focusing on two of them. Um, we're going to be looking at status codes. Status codes are going to play a role. Okay, uh, we do care about those. Um, so status codes meaning whether or not the page loaded good. And when I say, actually, it's not the page, right? We talk about the page. The page is really a document or the page is really the response, right? We talked about a little bit about that request response cycle, right? We talk about a page in HTML, but we can't, we don't only request HTML um, from a, over HTTP. We can request anything. We can request files. We can request HTML. We can request JPEGs, MP3s, whatever. Okay, we, there, the sky's the limit. Um, but knowing whether or not we were able to successfully complete, retrieve, find the file, right? Having those status codes is very good. Um, we also talked a little bit about statelessness or that the web has no state, right? Um, and that every request and response are completely separate and have no memory of the request or responses that came before it. Okay. And that's something that uh, all of those, all of these things are going to continue to play a recurring role in our programming. Okay. It's always good to keep those in mind because it really helps you understand. I have a hair. This is like a hair sitting somewhere over here. I can see um, all of those play a really big role in and will really help you understand things. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So questions, comments, general statements of interest. Okay. Then today, without further ado, we're finally getting in to doing something interesting with promises. We're gonna come back to those. So today we're going to talk about uh, APIs, okay? And we've already talked about APIs before. Does anyone remember what API stands for? Let me share my screen here. API programming interface application programming interface yeah let me bring up my VS code um, get rid of all this stuff here bring up today's lesson your lesson five okay yeah so we're gonna look at apis today. Okay, so an API is a application programming interface. Okay, so an application, and it is almost exactly like it sounds, an interface, right? It's an, what is an interface? An interface is something that allows us to interact with something, right? We have, uh, right now, you are using an interface um, in Windows. That is called, usually we refer to those as a, a graphical user interface, okay, or a GUI, okay. It's, it, it's, a, it's something that allows us to interact with Windows, right. Um, we, in programming, have something called programming interfaces. 
because we want to interact with the programming language or interact with the application, okay? Um, and we've been using APIs already. Does that, can anyone tell me an API that we've been using? VS Code. JavaScript API. Okay. The, uh, the term API is very all encompassing. There's a lot of things that uh, fit into the API uh, acronym, including JavaScript, including every programming language. So all of this stuff, all of this stuff like math.random, math.floor, document.getElement by ID. Right. This is all part of JavaScript's programming interface, right? We don't really know how this works. All we know is it gives us an interface that allows us to interact with our program, right? It allows us to interact with our application. How it does it under the hood, that's not important. We don't really care. Right. And so this gives us an interface to perform actions and do things with JavaScript in JavaScript. Okay. So we use an, a programming interface, an API all the time already. Every language is like this. We, we generally, when we're, when we're talking about APIs relative to a programming language, we're usually talking about like, how well do you know that programming language? A, uh, array prototype map, right? Like how well do you know that language? And knowing the language means I, knowing the API means like I know a lot about the language, a lot of what the language has to offer. Not just like how it works, right? Like how the memory management works, how the, this works, how that works, but actually what sort of pieces of interaction, what sort of methods, what sort of objects it provides to me that I can use to build a program. So that's one type of API, okay? There, and so API can refer to that. Another type of API though, and the one that we're going to look at is the type of API that other people provide to us. I mean, this JavaScript, I consider JavaScript other people too, but this one is more like, um, <clears throat> for example, there are lots of, lots of pieces of data out there in the world that we want, we can pull information from and interact with, okay? Um, for example, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, just to name a couple. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you a couple more simple ones, okay? But the concept is that these places have so much information and so much data about all sorts of stuff that they created an interface that allows us to ask for data back. And then we're allowed to do whatever we want with that data, build applications. So the idea is that they don't have to build all these additional applications on top of Facebook. They just say, here's data that users can use. So for example, um, I used to do, uh, I used to work on this project um, at my old company and it was the last project I was working on. We were working with a, um, what, what were they? Um, it was for health and they were testing movement um, and arthritis. It was an arthritis foundation. And they wanted to build an app about movement and about tracking, like, I can't exactly remember exactly what the app does, but what we needed to do was we needed to gather movement data from users, right? Um, so how do we gather movement data from users? Like, so are, are the users gonna pick up their phones and enter the data as they like move around all day? Well, no, not that. Are they gonna have to have their phones on them all day? No, not, not that. Instead, what we did was we bought all the participants of the study Fitbits, okay? Just regular Fitbits. Now, we can't read 
Fitbits directly. I can we cannot connect to a Fitbit directly. Fitbit syncs data to the Fitbit app. Okay. But what Fitbit does, the company, is they allow developers to sign up for their API, their programming interface. Okay. And Fitbit collects all that data from all the people who are syncing their devices and it aggregates it. And they say, or, or we can authenticate. A user can say, yes, I allow this company to pull down my data, right? So these, these participants said, yeah, I allow this, your company to take, to borrow my data from Fitbit. So we would pull in that data from Fitbit and we would use it to construct our app. So we knew, although we weren't able to directly connect to Fitbits, Fitbits took the data and then just put it online and we were allowed to pull it. So I can find out how many steps every person took. I was allowed to find out that, you know, when were, when were they active? Show me the times, do this, do that, right? And with that data, I can construct anything I want. So then I can remind people, hey, it looks like you haven't been active for five minutes. Maybe you should get active. And the fit, it's not the Fitbit telling me, it's the Fitbit talking to their application, but I'm pulling that information in. So I'm using Fitbit's API to pull that data in and build whatever the heck I want using that information. So that is the type of API we're going to be working with. We're going to be working with external APIs from companies, things like Winnipeg Transit API that tells you everything that you've ever wanted to know about any bus and its route in Winnipeg. Okay. And we're going to build a little program with that. We're going to look, we're going to work with movie APIs. Every movie that was ever done, who's in it, all the actors, posters, everything. Um, we're going to look at Marvel API. We can look at the Pokemon API. We can look at the Facebook API. Okay. There's so much information out there. It's just, and then we can use it to build whatever we want. Okay. Any questions so far? All right, then let's go look at our first API. I think that's what we're doing right now. Do, 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 do. Yeah, let's go look at our first API. Um, so this API, this is a very simple fake API. Okay, this is the first API we're gonna work with because it's so simple. Um, okay, it's a fake API and it's just to kind of get things going. Okay, just to, just to get things going a little bit. So you understand uh, maybe a little bit what we're doing and uh, without overwhelming you. So this one's called JSON placeholder. Okay, super simple API. Um, and it shows you how to use it. Every API has different documentation, has its own documentation because it's the company, it's the individual, it's the, it's the people who are putting this API up um, and making it available that are putting together the documentation. There is, no, there is no absolute standard. There's kind of a loose standard about how the documentation should be done. And it's really, the documentation is really important because it tells you how to use the API, okay? Um, and so it's really important to have good documentation and every, since every API is different, some APIs might have some really good information in them, but they have super shitty documentation. And so it's really hard to understand how to use it, how to connect it together. Some of them have great documentation, but they don't work. Some of them, like, it's kind of a grab bag. And so the bigger the company typically like Facebook, has insane documentation. Um, it works, they have like, it's a very thorough thing. Okay, other smaller companies, maybe not. So it was pretty good. Uh, so this one, this is the type of information it has in here, okay? And this wouldn't be necessarily uncommon, okay? Um, it has, and these are, this is fake information. This is just fake data. So pretty much what we're pulling in from APIs is data. We're pulling in data. Um, usually this data is going to be in a format called JSON. Okay. 
And I've talked about JSON before, JSON, okay? Stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And that means it is in this type of notation. E, value. The big difference is in, in JSON versus a real JavaScript object, all the keys and all the values have double quotes around them. You could do that in, in, in regular JavaScript, right? You could put all your keys in double quotes, um, but typically all of them have double quotes. Uh, and the other thing you can have too in JSON is uh, you can also have arrays. So you can have an array of objects, okay? But it's just, they're just Jap plain JavaScript objects. That's it. They're essentially key value, key value, key value, key value. And that value can be another JavaScript object. You'll see what I mean, okay? So that is typically the type of data that we're getting back from these APIs, but there is technically no limit to the type of data that we're getting back. Again, it comes down to documentation. Um, what are we getting back? When, so the way that we interact with these things is we make a request for information and they make a reply. So just like any typical regular web page request reply, we say, give me this at this URL and they say, here you go. Usually when we're browsing the internet, we say, give me the web page and they say, here's the HTML. But now we're going to be saying, give me the, data and they're going to say here's the json okay now maybe maybe one day not in this course but maybe one day we're going to want to say give me the image and they're going to say here's the image give me the mp3 here's the mp3 right we can do that we just won't be doing that in this course okay we're going to be mainly working with apis that provide us with json and JSON is just plain text, okay? They may give us a URL to an image in the JSON, which then we can use to load up a URL, but uh, to use a load up an image. <clears throat> so the way that we typically do this is with two, one of two different types of requests. Either we create a get request or we create a post request. Today, we're only gonna do gets. So this website has the following pieces of information. It has users, to-dos, photos, photo albums, comments, and posts. Now, if I were to start talking about that type of data, you might start thinking like, hey, users, to-dos, Maybe a user has a to-do. Maybe a user has a photo. Maybe photos have albums. Maybe albums belong to posts. And maybe posts have comments, right? Like, a, usually when we're interacting with data, a lot of, from a specific API, that information is connected somehow, right? And there's usually some sort of theme. If you think of the Facebook API, we would have access to, um, anytime, by the way, you go and you say, log in with Facebook, sometimes a little thing pops up and says, do you want to give extra access to this? Uh, do you want to give extra access to this app that allows the person to see this, 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 and this on your Facebook account, right? That's, that is giving that developer or that company permission to access your information through their API. So if you think about Facebook, what kind of pieces of information do you have at Facebook that might be connected? Well, you have posts, right? You have posts on your wall. You have comments, right? There are comments on those posts. Those comments have users. Users have posts, right? So from my post, I can get a comment. From that comment, I can find another user. From that user, I can get their posts, right? All this data is floating around and it's all connected, okay? And it's up to us to pull it in and use it however we want. So we have our API, this one, okay? Really simple, it has 
we call these endpoints, these URLs. So this is slash posts, slash comments, slash albums, slash photos. What that means is this URL slash posts. So when it says slash posts, they're talking about their domain slash blah, slash posts, slash, okay. And these are called resources here, okay. They're resources. Users is a resource. The user's resource, the to-do's resource, the photo's resource, okay. So when they say comes with a set of six common resources, um, you'll hear that term often repeated, probably not by me, but definitely in the documentation about APIs, okay? You'll also hear the term REST, REST, RESTful APIs. We'll talk about that later, okay? So let's click on users and take a look to see what this endpoint gives us. Okay, uh, I, I, it's a resource, it's also an endpoint. And you'll notice it printed out to my browser a giant JavaScript object, okay? So all the keys have double quotes. Some of the, um, some of the values do and some of the values don't. So look at all this information here. Like we used to create fake users that look kind of like this. This is very thorough, right? It has an ID, a name, username, email, address, suite. Where's this information coming from? It's coming from them. It's their users. Now these, is, these are all fake users, so they don't really mean anything. This is, it's just for a sample, okay? And we can use these. Now, how do we do that? Do we just copy and paste? Copy, bring that into JavaScript, paste, throw it in an object, right? No. Okay. So a couple of things here. We're not just pulling, we're not just copying this and bringing this into JavaScript. JavaScript is dynamic. JavaScript is used to make more interesting, interactive websites. So instead, what we're going to do is at some point in time, for us to start that, that point in time is going to be when the web page loads. We're going to reach out at that time, pull in this data, and use it to actually build that website at that time. So we're gonna be pulling this in with JavaScript. We're not going to be using the browser like we're using here. We're going to be pulling it in with JavaScript, okay? Later on in the course, starting next week, we're going to be doing it on in response to act um, in response to events that occur. So, oh, someone clicked on a button. Okay, I'm going to go out, pull in data, and then just and update the DOM based on the data that I just pulled in. Okay, so in response to an, an event. This concept of updating a web page after it has already been loaded was totally crazy. Um, and it really took off in the 2005, 2006, 2007. Okay, so before that, whatever was loaded on the web page, that was it. Okay, the web page loaded up. And that was it. There was never any additional things that were going out to the web again, pulling in more data and updating the page anymore. That was not, that did not exist. Finally, that concept was discovered, invented, whatever, okay? And it got a name and that name is Ajax. So this, this concept, because we are reaching out, right? Like in our JavaScript code, we're going to be reaching out and we're going to be pulling in data. Let's actually 
I think the best thing to do right now is for us to try this and to see how it all works, to see if we can make sense. So we have this endpoint here, JSON placeholder type of code slash users, uh, dot com slash users. I'm gonna paste it for you into Discord, okay? And that way you have it. And we're going to build our first uh, Ajax call. Okay, so let's do this in a browser to start. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Let's do this in browser to start. I'm a little apprehensive because I know some stuff, um, but it should be okay. Go to important about blank in your browser, open up your console. And type in the following, const anything, any, any variable, doesn't matter, equals fetch. This is a new word for us, fetch. Inside fetch, fetch takes a string. And that string is the URL that we want to request data from. And that URL was that URL that I said, the URL, the domain for the website, plus the protocol, plus the path to the resource, slash users, and hit enter. There you go. And you're probably thinking, okay, nothing happened. Let's inspect this. So I have my variable name here, anything. Let's look at what anything is. Oh shit. Anything is a promise. Okay. We talked about promises. A anything is a promise. Why is why is going out, why is asking JavaScript to go out and retrieve data from some other website, right? I am not on this website. I am on no website at all. I'm asking JavaScript, okay, JavaScript, go out to this website and get me some data and bring it back. Why is that a promise? Why, why do we use a promise for this? I mean, this uh, is actually because it needs some time to get all the information from the URL. How long does it take? Fusion, how long does it take? Uh, it it depends. You are. Why yeah. Thinking? We have no idea. We have no idea how long this is going to take. Who knows where this is? Who knows how much data I'm asking for? Who knows if they're slow, right? So, this concept of asynchronous, right? This is where this is coming to play. We are reaching out to another website. And as you know, surfing the net, you don't know how long a website's gonna take to load. Usually it's pretty quick, but sometimes it's not. We don't want all that other JavaScript code to have to wait while we go out and do this. This is where that asynchronous promise comes into play. So fetch returns a promise. Fetch is a promise, okay? Fetch creates a new promise. And it says, okay, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna go get this data. When I'm done with this data, I'm gonna resolve, okay? Which means we can start attaching thens to it, which means we can attach thens to it to say, okay, now that you got this data, let's do something with it. Let's put it in the DOM. Let's do some calculations, which let's update some pictures. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is that we need to do with the data, right? So um, let's take, actually, let's dig into this a little bit. We can actually see 
this request go out on our system. Now we didn't see it go out here, but in this network tab we can. Um, it's massive. So you can see I made a request, okay, type fetch. So my page, this page that I'm on right now, which is a nothing page, made a request out to this users. And if I hover over it, you can see the, the, the full URL. If I click on it, I can actually see everything about this request response. So we talked yesterday about this request response. So I am making a request for information and I'm getting a response back. My method, and again, 95% of the time, our methods are get. And which is why I didn't have to specify anything. By default, fetch performs a get request to this URL by default, because that's like 95% of the stuff that we're doing. Um, and it came back with a code, status code 200. Okay, it worked. Okay. It's got some uh, IP information. Okay, it's got the path that I used, the schema I used. Um, it's got all this stuff, okay? But what we don't have is, I don't have any data. Like I'm looking at this promise, and there's no data in that promise. But we know that the promise itself, when we look at it like this, doesn't contain the data, right? It's the stuff that comes after, right? Remember, inside promises, promises are calling resolve or reject. And it's inside that resolve that the data is going to lie. And to access that, we need to attach a then onto it so we can get that data. Right? This is what we're used to. This is what we're used to seeing so far, right? Resolve does stuff, or promise does stuff. And at some point in time, and this is what we're used to so far, this is what we've been looking at for the past couple of days. And at some point in time, actually, let me just uh, get a JavaScript file open here. And at some point in time, so this does stuff is like, go out to that URL, do the request thing, bring back some data for us. Okay. Now we don't know how that works and that's okay. Fetch knows how that works. Fetch is doing it for us, but fetch is, fetch returns a promise. So fetch is kind of like this format ish. So we can actually, so it's going to, at some point, either do one of these. It's going to do one of these. It's going to resolve everything went well and probably some data came back or it's going to reject. And I don't know, maybe we weren't able to connect. Maybe we weren't able to, maybe that URL was incorrect. Okay. And actually we can test that out if I put an incorrect URL in here. Um, actually that would probably 404. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that short. Okay. And so we start to deal with that, all that stuff inside the bed. Okay. Inside this request response though, if we go back to the network tab, we can actually see the response. Okay, this is just, again, a very kind browser feature that allows me to see the response. Okay, I'm just looking at it. And again, that's no different than what this looks like. But we can actually see the response that's coming back from this particular request. Now, how do we access that in, in the JavaScript? Okay, again, this is a, this is a, a, a UI. This is a user interface. We, we want it in programming. We want to be able to pull that data directly into our JavaScript so we can start using it. How do we do that? Okay. So let's grab this, this fetch. 
and I put in my JavaScript, we're going, if this returns a promise, we want to add some thens onto it. Two thens, in fact. But we will start with one. And we will take a look at what it has to offer. Now, if you go to the fetch documentation, okay, which you don't have to right now, I'll tell you, fetch says that if it was successful, it's going to return not just the data. It's returning the entire response, everything. The response includes headers. The response includes, so we're looking at, so here's our response, okay? It includes all sorts of crazy stuff, including um, was the response, what's the response status? What's the response method? Let's take a look at this response because that's what it's returning. That's what it's returning. It's returning actually a response. So to get that, we need to type in something like that. So our first, our first then, its job is to just take that response. So this is what happens. Fetch goes out. At some point in time, it's going to come back and it's going to bring with it a response. Everything is inside this response, including all that data, but there's other stuff in there too. So we were going to take, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at that. And again, we don't know how long this is going to take, which is why it returns a promise, which is why it's asynchronous. So this other stuff down here can still run while the fetch is happening. Okay, so while we're reaching out to the website and pulling data back in to do something on our web page, the rest of the JavaScript can keep running, assuming it's not tied to this data. If it's tied to that data, you, need, you don't want that to happen. You wanna move this into, the, into that fetch. So let's bring this to the browser and try this. So as you can see, my stuff is still running and I console logged that response. Let's take a look at what's in here. So obviously the response is a response, it's a response object, okay? And we're used to objects. It's got some of the following properties and methods. It's got a body, it's got headers. It has okay, so it has something called It's not responsive, okay, it's resp.okay, which is checking to see, was this a 200 status? Was, or was this a 404? If it was a 404, that response is not okay. See, the response is okay, colon true, because this was successful. Watch what happens on an unsuccessful attempt. Bad URL. Let's see what happens. Okay, is false. Status, 404. The status from the one before, 200. Okay. See, it, that response has a lot of stuff in it. Okay. Um, in addition, it has some methods on it that we're going to want to use okay because again like i said we don't yet have this body we don't yet have that data we have the response and in the response there's the data but we got to get it out and again that data is in javascript object notation but really what it is really what we're dealing with here is a giant string it's one giant string in a interesting representation of JavaScript, okay? We get this as one giant string. 
So we got to parse that. We got to break down this string into little piece, into a JavaScript object. Okay. So looking at this, you can see it's an array of objects. So it's an array of user objects. Okay. So we're going to have to break that down. And to do that, and this is, so this is a very common pattern that you're going to be performing. Okay, this pattern is common. Now, the reason why I'm spending all this time explaining everything up to this point is because this pattern might work for 90% of all the instances that you need to do, but there's gonna be occasions where it won't or occasions where you want to do something else or occasions where you need to change something. And at that point, if you don't understand what's going on, how can you change anything? So we are going to look at doing this. We take this response object, we return it, and we call a function on it that parses JSON. And it's simply called And what happens when we return something from a then? We are able to chain another then onto it. Because when we return something from a then, remember before we were just returning a number and it passed it to the next then and it passed it to the next then. And that's because when we return something from a then, it gets wrapped in a promise. Okay, again, promises, promises. And now we finally get, oh my gosh, our data. So I'm going to console log this data. So our response body, our, the body of our response, Jason knows this method knows where to go get the actual body, the actual data inside the response. It knows to ignore the, um, the headers. It knows to ignore all the stuff. It knows exactly where to go to get it because that response is always in the same place. It's always actually in this um, console. It's always actually in this body right here. Readable stream. It's always actually in here. Okay, so it knows how to get it. It knows how to parse it. Okay, we don't actually know. We, and we don't need to know. So when I take this and I run it, let's refresh this. I get an array of 10 JavaScript. So I'm console logging data. Data is literally an array of 10 JavaScript objects. And we can break that open and look at that. We have an array of 10 JavaScript objects. Address, company, email, ID, name, phone, username, website. So if I wanted to, now I know that data is an array. I can do stuff like data up for each. Right, data is an array. Iterate through the array. Each element is a user. And I'm going to just console log user dot name. So it'll print out the name of all 10 users that I was able to reach out across the ocean. Or I don't know. I don't know where this is hosted. Far away. Okay. And pull into my app in real time. And we'll clear this, paste that. Okay. Did I? Oh, I did not copy it. And there you go, right? Because remember, so these, so the way it works is these 
right? It's, a, it's an object, object dot key, right? Object dot key, and we're used to that. If I did this, and I said, how do you access the name of this object. You would say my object dot name, right? And that's no different. It just so happens that this is, so data is an array of objects and each object is broken down. So sometimes there, sometimes in these cases, let's take a look at this data actually, again, console.log data, sometimes if we open an object, if we get to an object, it has an object in an object. Address is not simply an address. So we would not access address like so first of all, if we were to access the first, first element of this array, right? The zero with element, that means this object. We would not access address like this directly. Well, we could, this is, but this is an object too, right? If we look at it, we open this up. Address is also an object. So we can get the street We can get the suite. We can get the city, we can get the zip code. And then geo, geo is another object. What's in there? Latitude, longitude. Okay, and we dig in, we dig in, we dig in, we peel back the layers. Okay, some of these might even be arrays. I wonder if there's an array in here we can look at. Not in the users one. Uh, there are in others, but some of them might even be arrays. Like maybe the user has to do's on them. And that is an array of more objects. So the only thing that you're going to be dealing with in JSON really is going to be strings, numbers, objects, and arrays. Okay, that's all that can be represented. Strings, numbers, objects, and arrays. Um, which is pretty much all the stuff that we learned about uh, the like fundamental stuff, the fundamental data types that we're used to using. Strings, numbers, objects, arrays. And that's pretty much all that's gonna be able to be parsed out of JSON. So it's either gonna be a number, it's either gonna be a string, an array of more things, an array of more objects, an array of more arrays, an array of more numbers, okay? That's really all that, that, that can be represented with JSON, okay? Sometimes you'll see a date in there, like a date timestamp to represent date or time. Um, you might need to do something with that. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get there. But this is, so this concept of us reaching out from a page that already exists, that's already been loaded, right? The request has already been made. The, the HTML has already been brought back. And when that HTML came back, it brought a little line of JavaScript. And that little line of JavaScript is running our JavaScript, right? So let's, Let's build this into uh, an HTML file, okay? To, so I can talk a little bit more about how this, this concept, okay? Um, so pretend that I'm putting this in an HTML file, which I will do right away. We're going to do something like this. Document.body.text content equals data. We'll get that first object name. The first object is uh, uh, some user, some random user, I don't know, and they have a name. So I'm just gonna get the zero element of this array of 
of user objects. And we'll, we'll print that out to the text content, okay? So I'm gonna save this and I'm gonna create a new file really quick. And this is going to be uh, index.html. I'm gonna do that. And we're gonna load up that JavaScript file. Oops. Sample.js. And we're going to defer it. Save that. Let's go look for this guy. And there you go. Yan Graham shows up. Now, here is how this happened. And here is what, and here is why this is impressive. Maybe not impressive to you, because we're 2020. Uh, 15 years ago, this was like Okay, 15 years ago, all we could do was load the web page and run some JavaScript. The JavaScript could not go and reach out to the web again and go get more stuff and update the page with more stuff. That did not exist. That concept did not exist, okay? But this idea, as I was mentioning before, came out of like, hey, let's, I don't know how they came up with this, okay? But this is called AJAX. And AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Now this part, so back in the day, we weren't getting JSON. Okay? Back in the day, we were getting XML, extensible markup language. If you've ever seen XML, um, I'm sorry. Okay, XML is terrible. Uh, it looks like really, really free form, hippie style HTML, where you can just do whatever you want. I don't like it. Not a lot of people, not a lot of people like it. But, so this part is not so true anymore, but the name still sticks around Ajax. Ajax is a concept. The concept is that our page, even though it's already been loaded in the browser, can still go out to other pages, other URLs, other locations on the internet and get data and update the content of this page, okay? That never used to happen. It used to be the web page goes out, it gets your HTML, your JavaScript, uh, all the images, your CSS, it loads it up. JavaScript might be used to count time or have hovers or rollovers or events, but none of those events, none of those things could actually go out anywhere and get more, more information, more data, more stuff. That just did not happen. But now it does, okay? Ajax changed that. So now your page can make multiple additional requests even after the page is already loaded. Before it was whatever data you get at the time, that's the data you get. That is what you get. Whatever JavaScript, whatever CSS, whatever stuff that you get got at that time, that's it. No more. Okay. But now we get so much more. We get Ajax. Um, so sometimes these are referred to as XHR requests. Okay. XHR. Um, the X again stands for XML. Okay, I actually don't know what the H and the R stand for. X, H, XML hyper, HTTP request? Oh yeah, okay, because the old way of doing this in JavaScript is uh, using something called XML, HTTP, XHR, XML HTTP request, that's what it's short for. Okay, so uh, before fetch, uh, fetch is ES6, so you may see some people use this XML HTTP request. If you do a search for Ajax JavaScript online, since JavaScript's been around for a long time, you're going to get a variety of things. The old way of doing it is through XML HTTP requests. You also might see this sometimes. Okay, this is jQuery, which is a superset superset of JavaScript, but we don't really use jQuery anymore. It's dead. Okay. 
Uh, you will probably use it in the back end, unfortunately, but trust me, it's dead. Um, so you might see this if you search for Ajax or how to do this stuff online, or you might see this, but this is the way we do it now, fetch. Okay. All right. So we've got about, let me see what I've covered. Let me see if I've covered everything I want to talk about. Ajax, fetch, checking for errors. Yeah, let's check for errors. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, we did this and everything just worked perfectly, right? What happens if an error occurs? Okay, and that's the big question. And it happens more often than you think. And this is why I, harp, I, I talked about errors for one of the first times ever. Like we talked about errors before, like, hey, this error stopped your JavaScript from working, just go fix this, go put a semicolon here, right? But these types of errors are different. When we're, typing about, when we're talking about errors with respect to external websites, they're far more frequent and far more common and far more manageable, right? So for example, Let's say one day this website goes down. And now because that website goes down, my website, which depends on all the data, stops working. How do I do that? Do I just have this little circle-y thing that just sits there and tries to load the data on my website? Using catch. The catch, yeah. Well, yeah, okay, so let's, let's throw a catch on there. Catch. Error function. And um, we'll do a, sorry. Okay, so use a catch. If this rejects, if this fetch rejects because of an error or it throws an error, it will skip over these ends and hit my catch, right? That's, that was the, that's what we learned about with the try with the then catch chain. Okay, so let's force an error. And I showed you I can force an error by just putting in the wrong URL. This is not a real URL. This path does not exist at this website. So what type of status are we gonna get here? 404. 404. 404, correct. Let's bring this into our document console refresh. Ah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> I'm doing a. Okay, so I'm. All right. So my code ran, right? This is my HTML page, right? It was supposed to print out the name, and instead I got a 404, and then I got a type error cannot read property name of undefined at line six. Document.body.textContent data name. It still ran this. Even though it responded with an error. The error was a 404. And the reason why it does that is because the way fetch works, the way fetch is programmed is um, HTTP status codes are technically not errors. So yes, it was an unsuccessful retrieval of data, but we successfully connected to the place you asked us to. It's just, we didn't get what you wanted us to get. And so it treats it as though, uh, yeah, everything's fine. We're just gonna keep rolling. And so what you have to do is you have to manage these status codes by yourself, which is why we, one of the reasons why we get this response object. So we can ask if the response is okay, right? It's 200 or 201 essentially. Okay, if the response has a status of okay, 200 okay, 
if it was successful in getting what we asked, do what we asked it to do. Otherwise, don't do what we ask it to do. Go to that catch, which can be throw new error, or better yet, throw response uh, dot, what do we have on response here? Error? I don't know. I don't know what we have on response. <laughs> Uh, throw response. Let's just throw the re let's just throw the whole object, and then we'll console out that response object okay, down here. So back, and this reappears. Okay, there's again there's another way to do this. I mentioned yesterday. Promise dot reject. We haven't seen this yet, but I had mentioned it yesterday that you might see this sometime, so I want to bring it in today. So this is just a instant reject of a promise. Okay, so if the response is not okay, reject the promise, otherwise, otherwise it's fine. And we keep going. So let's try this. And we ended up failing. And so we got the response out. And I think the response has status text. Let's see. Status, status text. Yeah. So instead, what we're going to do if we fail, we're going to say uh, response for error dot status. Out status. status so we got a 404. Okay, so even though we, so that's the challenge here. Even though it was, it erred, we still, we have to be careful because we have to, it can't just be, it can't just be, hey, I was able to connect but I, got the, I couldn't find the file you're looking for. It has to be more of a, hey, I was able to connect and I got the file you're looking for. Now I will continue. Otherwise, don't. So this pattern, uh, actually it should be more like uh, response. So this pattern is very common. Okay, it may not look exactly like this for the catch in the air. That is a little bit like hand wavy as to what you want to do. But this pattern is very common. Actually, this is probably more of the pattern you'll see. And I'll actually go to their JSON, JSON placeholder website to show you. It looks more like this. <laughs> it's very simple. Arrow functions. Right? So this, this little piece right here, these little arrow functions, you'll see this a lot too. But they're they're not doing anything, right? They're just console logging. These then functions, right? They can get busy. You can be looping over objects. You can be printing stuff out. You can be saving things. You can be checking things, right? These can get very large. So while you may see stuff like this, this is just a demonstration of how to use it. These, this is probably more realistic. Okay. And I think that's about it. Yeah. But you'll see arrow functions being used a lot. Okay, so get used to that. Um, I think if we do an incorrect one here, like an incorrect URL entirely, I think we actually get an error on that. Um, let me just double check that, like a real, real error. Yeah. Error name not resolved. That's, and that's an entirely different error. Um, it can't find this, and I don't think this catch works on that, does it? Oh, 
oh yeah, it does. That, so it fired that catch. So it still fired that catch. That's the only time, right? It did not hit this at all. It did not hit this first bend. Um, this was completely unsuccessful. So there was no response. No response means this didn't happen. None of this happened. It went straight from here over down to here. Okay, 404s. So responses like 404, 300, 500s, they will still get you into the vent. And then you have to check for what that response was. Otherwise, they're just going to skip. If you can't access the server at all, the server's down. LTLMS, for example, the other day, it was down. Right? We couldn't access it. It would have skipped over all this stuff and hit that patch directly because that counted as a real error. Okay. Questions about this? Talked a lot. Okay. How are you feeling about it? Are you scared? Are you Honestly, good? The, the API was really abstract for me. Yeah, and, and so like the concept of APIs is that like, it's hard to understand. So think of it right now, like, you know how all those exercises we were doing up till now, we were making up our own data or I was giving you data, right? And like, for example, the vending machine one, I was giving you data. Here, take these 10 items. But like, in reality, uh, you're not gonna just hard code your data into an application. In reality, you're gonna be pulling your data from some list of potential items that might be in our vending machines because we run a company that sells vending machines. What's, where's our inventory? Where's our stock maintained, right? Someone's not going into the code every time we get a new type of chocolate bar in and saying, oh, you know, got to put our new chocolate bar into the code. We need to put it in a place that allows our apps to pull from those lists, right? So it's always able to pull from those lists. So that data, instead of us hard coding our data directly into our applications, we're able now to not put any data in and pull data from elsewhere. Right, so that's essentially what these APIs are. They're just, they're just, it's just data. And so I refer to data a lot, right? Like it's just, it's just, it's just information. And, but that's all we do, we just work with information, okay? So these API endpoints, this one's not very interesting. Um, we can take a look at the Marvel one. We're going to dig it far more into this later, but like uh, Marvel API or the Pokemon API. They have a developer portal, uh, League of Legends. So, uh, Ray, I know you play League of Legends. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so you must be familiar. So, so uh, bear with me, people who don't play video games, especially not League of Legends, you must be familiar with this website? Yes. Okay, so um, when you look up a player, okay, when you look up a player, it's getting all this information from the League of Legends API. So the League of Legends, League of Legends has all a bunch of data. It has players, it has matches, it has weapons, it has like all this stuff. And this website decided what we're going to do is we're going to connect to that API. We're going to pull in all this data and we're going to put it together in a way so that way people can come and find out all this information about their player and about their games and about their history. And, and so that's all this is. This is just a collaboration, a mash, a remash of all that data, right? Yeah. This, this ability to click on this down arrow and show all this new data, well, that is, that is like, you are not able to do that any other way in that League of Legends game itself. The League of Legends itself does not present its own data like that but it has the ability, it could, but so people are essentially just taking this data from these websites and remashing it up into a new presentation, a new interesting way, a new way of looking at it. And so that's what these APIs are. So when we're talking about the Marvel API, for example, okay, 
Um, it's just gonna have information about, I don't even know what it has actually. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, this is on my list. Uh, characters. All the comics fetches lists of comics filtered by a character idea. So all the comic books that the characters appear in, stories, series, events, comics. So then it, you can either look at a comic, you can either look at a character and then look at all the comics they appear in, or you can look at a comic and see all, see all the characters that appear in that comic. Comic creators, events. I'm, I guess events might be like um, Infinity Stone War or something. Uh, series, stories. So this is the Marvel Comics comic API. So that's interesting. So this is all the data that, that, that's made available to us. What are we going to do with it? I don't know. But we can pull it into our application. Okay. So every API is going to be a little bit different in terms of what they offer which APIs you're going to use. Well, like I've never used this one before. I used to use the Facebook one often for work. Um, we used to use the Instagram one often. We used to use the tweet, the Twitter one often because people wanted those little like Twitter um, things on the side of their page, most recent tweets, right? And we would have to build those by hand. So we would go out using the API, go find the user, go find their most five recent tweets and design it and recreate it in JavaScript on the side of their web page. So like, it's just about going out, getting data, pulling it into your app and using it. Cause all of our apps, 100% of our apps are gonna be data driven. It doesn't feel like that, but trust me, that's what it is. Okay, it's all about data. If you think about any one of the applications that you built so far, um, the budget application, right? The budget application, we're creating and inserting the data by hand. But imagine if we wanted to maintain that long term and we want to have February's budget data and all the previous budget data. We, when someone hits our app, we're going to want to bring it in and load it up and then allow them to enter more and more data. Okay. Does that, does that help clarify things a little bit? I feel like it's, it's okay if you don't fully comprehend right now. I think at over time, as we start to use these things, you're going to start to realize like, oh, okay, this makes sense. Okay. Just again, just like promises. Promises until today, probably were like, when are we ever going to use that? Why are we going to use that? And now it's like, boom, here's a use case. Now we're actually using promises. Now how APIs work, why you'd want to use them, Again, I think it'll, we'll just use them for a bit and then it'll totally become crystal clear about why, right? The whys for now maybe are less important. It's more of the, the house. Let's just do it and build something with it. Okay. So for this weekend, what I'm gonna get you to do is We are at exercise five. I have included the documentation for fetch. I also included a little bit of reading from yesterday for fetch. Uh, this is like a very simple uh, walkthrough of how to use it. This is the Mozilla documentation. So like if you wanna know all the options or you're having problems and you need to like troubleshoot, this is the documentation. The exercise is this. So um, I want you to go to a website an API called random user and random user is a random user generator. That's all it does. It just generates random users. Okay. And again, it shows you, as I mentioned, it shows you a jQuery sample, but we are not using jQuery. Okay. We are going to use JavaScript just like I showed you. So we're going to use fetch. Okay. And it has an endpoint. It has endpoints and you're going to take a look at the documentation and it's going to say how to use introduction. How to use, this is like one of the simplest um, APIs I can find how to use. And 
it looks just like this. You can use Ajax to call and you will receive a randomly generated user in the return. Okay, so if we call this URL, we will receive a randomly generated user. Let's just try. We can actually try that from the browser because browsers by default send get requests. And there we go. We got a randomly generated user. Cool. So you're going to use that, but you are going to build. Uh, but instead of just finding one, uh, where is that right here? You're going to find out how to get 10 requesting multiple users. Okay. You're going to figure that out. <laughs> just scroll down again, find that line. It'll tell you how to do it. Okay. And all you're going to do is you're going to build this. That's it. A page of 10 users with this, these pieces of information. Okay. Every time I refresh this page, it's different because this is a random user API generator. So I, do I give you the, I don't think I give you the HTML either. Or do I? I think I do. Oh, no, no, no. I, I tell you, if you want, so we have the weekend, okay? The amount of code involved in actually doing this is pretty minimal. Um, so like this could probably take you two hours. Um, but if you wanted to take it further, I have parts two and parts three. Um, if you don't want to do, you're more than welcome to do the HTML and CSS. If you don't want to, figure out how to take it from my website. Okay. Normally I give it to you in a little zip. This time I'm not going to. This time I want you to figure out how to seal it from my website. We've been playing around with the browser. We've been playing around with source. Um, you've been using developer tools for a long time. That is my challenge. Or you could just build it by hand. Okay, it's not complicated. You just build one of these things, throw copy paste, throw 10 of them in a flex box, boom, you're done. Okay, but remember, this is all being dynamically generated in um, JavaScript. So you are going to build this, okay? Um, you should request 10 users at once, loop through those 10 users, print out all that information for all 10 of them, um, there is one little thing, the date that is provided is provided as a string, a crazy ass string. If you want to use it as a date object, so you have get year, get month, get date, you have to do this with it. You have to put the string inside a new date constructor, and then it will convert that string into a date object, which you can start asking questions about. It's pretty smart. Okay, um, and then another little issue, the API documentation is incorrect. I noticed this because I built this like five days ago. The user address is actually another JSON object, okay? Um, in the documentation, it says that you can just access it user.address, but that's not it. It's, you need to access it user.address.street, user.address.name, and name is street name actually. Okay, um, I'm intentionally being a little bit vague on some of this and not providing you with everything that you need because we are getting to the point now where we are well into our program and we need to start learning how to figure this stuff out for ourselves. Picking up, stealing HTML and CSS from a web page, I've never shown you how to do that, but you should be able to figure out how to do that. Um, Okay, a lot of the stuff is just repeat of the type of stuff that we've been doing up to now. Take this seriously. Show up on Monday with this done. Okay, if you don't do this, the next one's gonna be worse and then the assignment's gonna crush you. Okay, but this is not, it's really, really, really not hard. 
Um, you have me, you have Zach, there's not a lot of code, ask us questions, it's an exercise, work together. Okay, just make sure you walk away with a good understanding. Any questions? All right, wow, that's great. Looking forward to it. I think this is exciting. This is, I've been waiting three months for this. Like this to me, we can actually start to build interesting applications. Because now we're not tied to making up our own data. We can now go out and pull in data from anywhere around the world about any topic, about anything we want. If you want to build your League of Legends app for your phone, do it. If you want to build that Marvel Comics thing, do it. If you want to build your own Pokemon game, now you have all the Pokemon information and all their powers and all images and everything. Go build a game. Change your pig game into Pokemon. I don't know. Okay. So this is it. Um, I think this is a good opportunity for us to take a break now. So what we'll do is we'll take a break, take 15 minutes, come back at 1030, and we'll uh, move into our Git course. Okay. okay. See you in a bit. If you watch the videos in order, uh, I'm doing, I'm going, I'm flipping uh, them a little bit out of order just because I feel like it's a better way for presentation. So, uh, exercise, again, the exercise is rather small, um, but I'm gonna add a little bit to it right at the end here. Uh, when we start talking about it, I'm gonna add a little bit. Is there something else I want you to do? Okay, so, um, Turn this on and turn this on. And we're gonna look at initializing Git repo. So yesterday we started talking about Git. Okay, we talked about what Git is and I continually showed you um, Google Drive, right? The, uh, the documents thing there. Um, and, um, you know, I compared it and showed you how similar they were. And then I had you go to these certain things I wanted, first of all, you to go to several projects and initialize a Git repository. Okay, I'm not going to go through that process because I'll show you one again, okay? Um, but I'm not going to go through all of them. So what I'm going to do is over here, let's crack open a new terminal. Okay. One. John? Yep. Can you share your screen, please? Um, I guess, I think, I, I, sometimes I feel like it's better if you just imagine what my screen looks like. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. You got it, right? Did I share the right screen? Yeah, it's good, okay, cool. Okay. So we're gonna go to my um, Google Drive. We're gonna go to that project I just created, um, the new files I just created. So I kind of have a general idea of where it is on my computer, but I don't actually know very specifically. So I'm gonna look around, okay? So you're gonna see me use Bash and this is, this is how you use Bash, okay? So I know that um, my stuff is in a place called Mount C, uh, I think it's users. Yeah, okay, so to find that out, I usually like type in the first letter of where I think it is, and I hit tab, and if I'm right, I get it, <laughs> it'll fill it in, or it'll say uh, there's a couple of things with you in it in this directory, um, but I'm right, and I think it's J Nizzy. Okay, good, so I'm right. And then this is the stuff that's in that directory. Here's the other directories that are in there. And I can see my Google Drive directory right there. So I'm gonna type in capital G, because there's only one directory with G, and hit tab and it will fill that out. And then hit tab again and see what else is in there. There's only one folder in there. Hit, so it automatically fills that out. Hit tab again. Oh no, what did I do? Hit tab again. And I get to see more stuff. Okay, so it's 
SD, what do we, where are we in this line? 140 tab, and it will populate that. Hit tab again. I want to go to lessons tab. And I think it's in lesson, this morning was lesson five. Cool. So there we go. I navigated from my home directory all the way boop, 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 to that one directory. Okay. And we're going to take a look at what's in here. Because I remember I created, I created this sample JS and this index.html file to show you that stuff. So I'm going to move that into its own directory. Okay. So I'm going to make a deer and call that in class sample. And so now I have another directory in class sample. And I'm going to move those two into it. So I'm going to move sample and index. Oh, you can't do that. Uh, can you do that? No, you can't do that. Um, how do you move two at once? I actually can't think of it. Okay. In class sample. Uh, so we'll move sample into in class sample and we will move index. There's definitely a way to move more than one file at a time. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. There we go. So I moved two files into this new directory and we'll pop into this new directory and we'll clear the screen. Okay, so this is what it looks like in my new directory. This is that new little stupid project that I made this morning that just shows the error or the name of the user on the screen, right? The sample I did in class. So I'm going to track this in Git. So Git init. And that's it. Now I look at this and there we go. My Git folder showed up. Okay. I do a Git status and it says untracked files because these are new things that have never been backed up yet, have never had a snapshot taken, have never been committed. The proper term is committed, okay? Um, but they, they haven't, these files haven't yet been committed to the repository, okay? And that's the terminology that you would most likely hear. These have not been committed to the repository, okay? They are untracked. Really though, what that means is these files have not been backed up using a snapshot yet. Okay, that's what that's another way of putting it. Um, okay, so I went, I moved some stuff around, and I did a git initial a git init, and it initialized this directory as a new repository. And again, you can tell because this directory has a .git folder in it. This little master thing showed up. Um, who followed those guides yesterday to get uh, that were shown in the videos to get this stuff on your console, on your terminal? There's guides in the videos to, to, to help you sh have this on there. Who followed those? Yeah, I do that. Oh. Yeah, I do too. Two people. Okay. Well, okay. Super helpful. Again, I don't assign reading and videos for no reason. There's useful information in there. So um, we are here now, but let's call that number one. Okay, we checked its status too. Now we're going to do the Pied Piper Fun GitHub page, go to it and figure out how to clone it. And I showed you how to do this yesterday. Um, really all I do is I just copy the URL. And I'm going to clone it into this directory here, this lesson five directory. Actually, yeah, because I'm going to delete all this stuff after. I do want to clean all this stuff up after. Okay, so I'm going to clone it into here. Git clone is the command. Paste. Okay, so it will create a new directory called Pied Piper Fun in the current directory that I'm in. And it clones it and we take a look and we see the Pied Piper fun directory has shown up. So I'm going to go into there and we're going to take a quick look, get status. 
I'm going to actually make this big. Um, so that way this whole URL almost, almost fits. This whole path almost fits. We're going to do a get status. Okay. And there you have it. We have one untracked file desktop.ini, which is, I think that's added by Windows as a hidden file. Um, and so that's why it shows up in Git. Okay. Um, so we cloned one. If we don't tell it which directory to clone it into, it will clone into the directory that it decides. But we can also control that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to re I'm going to reclone this, and I can clone this as many times as I want. So I'm going to step out one directory, and I'm so I'm back into this top level directory here, lesson five, and I'm going to reclone it. But this time I'm going to give it a name as an additional option. Okay. And so now, instead of cloning it into a directory called PyPiperFun, it's cloning it into a directory called MyPyPiper. Okay. So if we look at this now, I have another directory, MyPyPiper. And we can go into there and we can see .git. We can see all the stuff. We can see, again, all those images came in, right? Remember yesterday I said Git tracks differences to text files, but doesn't do binary files like images very well. It's not that we can't track binary files like images and MP3s and stuff. It's just that it doesn't track the differences very well, right? So we still put those MP3s, we still put those images, we still put icons in our repository. They just the way that it manages the diffs, the differences between them. It can't just tell, oh, one line changed. Oh, you drew a mustache onto that character, right? It can't figure that out. One picture and then another picture with one different pixel are two, considered two totally different things, okay? But we still do it. We still track it in there. And now we have all the data to run this thing, actually. So if I wanted to, uh, I, I don't know if I can open from here. No, I can't because I don't have this set up properly. Right? But um, yeah, I have everything I need. Can I explore from here? No. Open. No. Uh, but I, it is on my window stuff. Okay? So I could run this if I wanted to. I could open the website. So we looked at how we can clone into a directory based on the name. We looked how we can clone into a directory that is, we can give it a name. And I'll show you one more. Um, we can make a directory and then we can go into that directory and we can clone it right into here without creating a new directory inside. So instead of the name of the directory, we just say dot, and it will explode the stuff into the current directory. And it's not an empty directory. Yeah, that's what I want. Uh, maybe they change this in the, okay, that's fine. Never mind. You don't need to use that anyway. Git clone path is fine. Okay. Any questions on that? Oh, that's why it's not empty. Has to be an empty directory. Any questions on any of that? So why why when you create a new directory called test that there's a file inside it called desktop i i not that's windows that's windows oh. for you um mac os has a has its own hidden file does anyone know the name of the hidden file in the mac os you've seen it before because i've given you folders that contain it and you've probably been like what's this file
You've seen this file before, right? You've seen it. Yeah. I've seen, yeah. yeah. Right. Dot GS store, especially windows users. Cause I've given you stuff from my Mac, like zip files. And I've been like, here's the index and the styles of CSS. And then when I open them on my windows machine, I notice this file shows up because it's it, on my Mac machine. It doesn't show up because it's got a dot in front of it. It's hidden. So windows doesn't subscribe to that same sort of method. And so Mac just adds that on windows, windows just adds desktop I and I, but by default desktop I and I is hidden. And so when pe most people are browsing through their windows file explorer, they don't see desktop I and I, I have all, I'm showing all my, um, my files though. I have it shown. I have it. Oh, maybe it's in Google drives. I don't know. I wonder what's in here. Interesting. I, I don't know what this file does, but it's added automatically. Might be from Google Drive. I thought it was from Windows, but it might be from Google Drive. Any other questions? Okay, so now that we know how to create a location, a repository where we can start backing things up, now we need to learn how to back things up. Okay. So today we're going to learn how to back things up. That's the next step. Okay. How do we do what we call commits? How do we commit and add, add and commit new files to the repository? Okay. So I'm actually going to use uh, this in class example as our first sample here. Okay, this is a good one. So this is one I just made, right? Um, I just made this five minutes ago, right? Moved the files into here, created a new Git repository. I do Git status and I get this. So we're gonna break this down. On branch master, we won't break that down yet, okay? No commits yet. Okay, there have been no commits, no snapshots taken yet. That's what that's saying. No snapshots taken yet. Nothing added to commit, but untracked files present. Use git add to track. Untracked files. So these are not tracked. These are not being backed up is essentially what they're saying. They've never been backed up. No one's ever told us that you want to back these up. Okay, that's the big that's the big difference with Git and something like Time Machine or like some sort of backup software. Backup software for your desktop, when you do, when you add a new file, it automatically gets backed up. Okay. With Git, what it does is it says, hey, you added a new file. We don't automatically back up stuff. Okay, you need to tell us what to back up. And then you need to tell us when you want it to back up. It needs, it needs a lot of hand holding. And that's good. Okay, it may sound like it may sound not good, but it actually is good because as developers, we want a lot of control. Okay. I want a lot of control over everything that's going on here because our code is very sensitive. And we don't want just things being backed up on its own. We don't want it to have a mind of its own and do all this stuff automatically. We want control. Okay. So we we're balancing the, the more control we have, the more flexibility we have, and we want that flexibility, but the more work it takes. And so it's kind of that trade off, right? But that's okay. So the concept of untracked files means you have new files, you never told us that you want these things backed up or even tracked, okay, ever backed up. So it's putting them in red, kind of saying like, do you, what do you want to do with these? What do you want us to do with these? And then it has this little message. Use git add file to include in what will be committed. Committed means 
take a snapshot. Okay. So the first thing we do when we want to add files to be committed to this snapshot, to this backup, we need to perform a command called git add. So we need to tell git which files we care about. I care about these two. I don't care about this one. I don't want to back that one up because if we're sharing this, I don't want you to have my desktop INI file. That's not important to running this project. Okay. That's some sort of weird thing on my windows, probably not on your Mac and maybe not even on your windows. Not important for you to have it. I want you to have the files that are important for you to run this project. And that file is not important. Or I want the files that are important for me to back up. So if something were to happen, I can restore this project. Now I might be restoring it to this computer. I might be restoring it to another computer, but again, this is probably not a file I need. So I want to track, I want to back up these two. So we're going to add those two. We're going to tell Git, these are the two files we want you to back up. So we're going to do this, Git, add, sorry, I'm going to uh, just zoom out a little bit, do that, Git, add, and it was index.html. Okay, so we're going to do that one. I'm going to hit enter. You can follow along, pick any directory you want that's already uh, Git directory, one of those ones that you did yesterday, because you haven't, the, all of the files in there are going to be new. Okay. Now we're going to hit enter. And again, as per, as per usual, no feedback from the terminal with just another prompt again, that means success. That means it worked. If something went wrong, it would have informed me. And the next one is git. Uh, what else did I add? Samples. Sample. Git. Git add sample. So JS. And enter. Okay. And there you have it. So. John. Yep. You can add um, two of them in one line. Yeah. You can add two of them in one line. You can add all of them in one line. I'll show you how to do that. Okay. So we're going to, now we've added the two that we care about. We're going to do get status and we're going to see hmm, a new, new thing. We're going to see some green. Okay. Still on branch master, no commits net. So usually the process is, Add some get status. Find out what is what the hell is going on. Okay, it gives you some information. No files tracked, or these are added, but they're not. Like it'll give you a bunch of stuff, bunch of information. Then, then you do some work, um, doing some adding. Add add the files you want to track, and then you type in get status again to make sure that you're doing that you got everything that you wanted. Okay, so it had said I had three untracked files. Now it says I have one untracked file and two changes to be committed. So I have not yet backed these up. All I've done is said, mark these files to be backed up when I push the button to do the backup. So what's going to happen next is I'm essentially saying, okay, I want this file backed up, this one, 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 this one. Okay, so I've told you all the files that I want backed up, but now I still need to push the button, the backup button. And then what will happen is it will say, okay, here's all the files you told me to back up. Now I'm gonna back them up, okay? And it will leave this one out and that's fine, okay? I don't want it to be backed up. So that is what this green stuff is going for here. Changes to be committed, okay? So this is called the staging area. These files are staged. They're on stage, they're ready to be backed up 
they're the ones that are going. So that, that's what that means. This is the staging area. Okay. So where it says, use this command to take a file out of staging. So we can actually get this file back down into here, right? We can unselect it like, oops, I didn't, I actually didn't want that file to be backed up. If we do this, git rm dash dash cached index.html. And then if I do a git status, that one moved back from the staging area back into files that I don't want backed up. So we can move them back and forth if we need to. Okay, but I do care about that. So I'm gonna get add index.html again. Oh, by the way, your tab for autocomplete of paths and files still works here. So if I say git add i tab, oh, no, didn't. Oh, it must be git add in. It's already added, so. Oof. A little bit. So what if you add something that's already been added? <laughs> yeah, if you add something that's already been added, it doesn't like that. I just tried it. Okay. Um, so it has to be not added. But if it's not added, then you hit tab, it'll autocomplete. Okay? That's pretty standard for everything in terminal. Whenever you're talking about a path, or a file, tab for autocomplete is pretty common. It doesn't try to autocomplete commands. Like it's not gonna to try to autocomplete git a tab, okay? It won't try to autocomplete the command because that's a command. But this piece here is a file or a path to a file. Those can be autocompleted pretty much everywhere in bash for everything, okay? This not just git, not just bash commands, pretty much everywhere all the time. Sorry, I mean, what what if you uh, what will the uh, get response if you add something that's already? Oh, what will the get response be? Nothing. Just okay. Now yeah. you added it twice. Ooh, big deal. Nothing changes. So will that create two? Oh, okay. No, no, no. It's like you check the checkbox and you just drew over that checkbox with another check again, right? It's not any doesn't reinforce anything it doesn't create another copy of it no no so we've marked these files now aside from turning green there's a new piece of information beside it new file okay now you're going to get a variety of little pieces of information sometimes there will be new files sometimes there will be changed files and we'll see that right away these are new the reason why it says this is because they're new. They've never been backed up before. That's what it's saying. I've never tracked this file before. This is brand new to me. So just letting you know, new file. Okay. So now we have this setup ready. We have our, we have our repository created. We have new files added. We, we created new files, right, in our directory. It get noticed them. It said, hey, you've got new files. What do you want me to do with it? I said, track this, track that. Okay, now it's time to push the backup button. So that, <laughs> that is called a commit. So we're gonna take a snapshot now. We're gonna back it up. We're gonna commit. We're gonna do a, what's called a commit. Okay, a commit looks like this. Get commit. Okay, now, if we hit enter and you set up your um, editor correctly, it should pop open VS Code. If you didn't set up your editor correctly, you're going to get stuck in a program likely called Vim, um, <laughs> which every good developer has gotten stuck in Vim before. Okay, it is a text-based um, text editor for the terminal and it's really complicated. And before I go into here, let me see if I have the eye. This is what it might look like. Okay, uh, to get out of here, it's colon Q. You don't wanna get stuck in there though, but you should be okay. 
it should be okay. Okay, so it's git commit colon q, by the way, again, in case you get stuck in there, in case you didn't set things up correctly. Git commit enter. And my editor opens up and it says, waiting for your editor to close the file. So what's happening here is it's giving me that my editor's opening up. It doesn't just back it up, it backs it up, but it's saying, give me a tag, give me a little bit of information about this, okay? So, the, so we put in what we call a message. Okay, this is called a commit message. So if you think about it, every time we hit the backup button, it says, okay, I'll back it up. Maybe you wanna put a little uh, note about what this backup contains. So that way, when you look back at all your backups, you're like, oh yeah, this is that day I did that special thing with the photos and turned them all grayscale. I didn't like that. I wouldn't go back one day further than that, right? So you are able to add little notes to all your backups so that way when you're looking at your list of backups, you know what they represent. You know what's happened in them, okay? Because we're gonna be backing up a lot. So we're gonna have a ton of teeny little changes that are little snapshots that are taken, okay? And so we wanna know what all these represent. So this is called a commit message, okay? So our commit message, and this is actually like a big deal, okay? The commit message is actually really important. Um, it's a big deal to your coworkers, it's a big deal to your company. Just like your CSS and your HTML and your JavaScript has a style, commit messages have a style, okay? I'm not going to harp too much on the style of your commit messages for this course, um, because we've got enough other things to worry about and you'll have lots of time to practice them and get good at them. It's like writing, right? You get good at writing. But generally, in our commit messages, we talk about the changes that have occurred. What the changes do, okay? Not what changed, because we'll be able to figure that out by looking. We talk about, in general, what these changes do. So, in this case, I, um, what did I do? These files uh, request users from a fake API and display the name. So, request users from a fake API and displays the name. Okay, you can see at the top, it says commit underscore edit message. Our commit message should be short. I think they say maximum 50, 60 characters. You don't wanna go long, okay? Because we're going to be viewing a lot of this stuff in the terminal. And as you can see, when things are really long at the terminal, they don't display very well. And so we wanna keep them short, okay? So something like this, a very simple sentence that describes what these changes to the files do, not what they are, what they do, is what you should be going for, okay? If we wanted to add more detail, we put in two lines and we can add additional paragraphs of detail. Like lots and lots of information that spans multiple lines if we need to. Okay. So the first line is the actual, what we call the message, the commit message. It is terse and it is descriptive about what it does, what this, what the files, con, 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 the files that are constituted within this backup, what they do as a, as a unit, okay? And then in addition, we can add additional information with a line, an empty line, plus paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs, 
whatever we need. Okay. Now, when you're done writing your commit message, you save this file, control S, and then you close it. Okay, but before I close it, I want you to show you, I want to show you something. So I'm gonna go back to my terminal, I'm just gonna switch screens. And my terminal is sitting here waiting, waiting for your editor to close the file. It's actually waiting for me to perform this action. If I don't do this action, the commit is not complete. The backup doesn't finish. So the final action is close this file. I close that file and it says master root commit. And this is the ID, this little thing, this is called a SHA, S-H-A, a hash. And it's an ID. It's a unique ID that is given to that snapshot that was created by Git. They created an ID and assigned it to it. It says, here is the message. And you see, this is only the short message, not the long message. And it said, two files changed, right? I added two files, 29 insertions. That really means 29 new lines of code were added. Create mode. It created a new file, index.html, and created a new file, sample.js. And that whole process took me five minutes. Your, your terminal doesn't show you that, but okay. So there we go. We took our first backup, our first snapshot. Now the process is multi-step and it's not as easy as, it makes it, as I make it sound. You just push a button, okay? That's okay, right? The flexibility. Now, let's take a look at what things look like now. Git status. Now, it doesn't have no commits yet, okay? What we do have instead is we have untracked files. We still have that one untracked file. That's okay, okay? I'm never gonna add that. I'm never gonna track it. And that is the process for adding new files and tracking them. So uh, this is like, project based right mm -hmm. okay so what i did before isn't uh, like the right way to use this i think i just uh, in it for my the entire uh folder it contains every like my html and the js files so it doesn't no. okay no you want so generally how we do this is it's broken down into projects so we would create a separate repository for each project okay, because we want to be able to manage every project individually. Okay. So the way I present this, I present this like a backup option, but it's really a lot more than that. It's more than a backup option. And because that it does more than back things up, it tracks changes. It allows us to share code. It allows us to um, manage a lot of stuff. Um, we don't want to overload it with too much information. We want to be able, the, 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 the smaller the things, so the more repositories we have on our computer, the actual more fine-grained control we have. If we just have one repository that encompass all of our projects, it gets, it's going to get really hard to manage when I want to undo a change on one project without affecting all the other projects, right? We want to create this, like, we, if we create one, um, one particular repository per project, then we, we get to manage that project separately from all the other ones. And we don't have to worry about any of these changes impacting anything else, right? For example, in my Google Docs, um, each document has its own list of revisions. Right, it's not like if I go back to May 4th on this document, all of the documents in my Google Drive are now reverted to May 4th. That would be crazy. So each document has its own revision history. Each document is managed separately. Just like over here we say each project has its own repository and each project is managed separately. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so 
I'll show you a couple more things and then we're done. So I still have this desktop.ini file, right? And sorry is probably like going crazy seeing this because I think she's the type of person that likes everything to be really organized. Sorry, am I right? Oh my God, yes. Yeah, you don't want to see this file sticking around all the time, right? And neither do I. And neither do any of you, honestly. I don't want to constantly be saying, get add this file, get add that file. Because like, get add one file at a time can be very time consuming. All right, what if I created a bunch of new files? Okay, so I create a bunch of new files. That's one thing I'm gonna do. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a small change to a file, to an existing file, and we'll see what that looks like. Uh, so actually, we'll echo um, a string and we'll append it to index.html. Okay, so that changed index.html, added some stuff to it. And I'm gonna remove a file, sample.js. So I just did a bunch of work here, right? I removed a file, I added a bunch of new stuff, and I changed the file. Okay. So the day's over or the time, like it's lunchtime, I'm gonna go eat. One of the tenants of this, of Git is, <laughs> yeah, commit early, commit often. Okay, so take many snapshots and take them. So take many snapshots and take them before you think you need them, okay? It's not uncommon for new developers to go days without taking snapshots. And that's not very helpful because we're sitting there all day programming. We're changing things all day. And three days down the road, I say, oh man, three days ago, I had the best idea and I was on the right path. And now I'm totally on the wrong path. I made some bad changes. I wish I could just go back to three days ago. And then you say, oh shit, but I haven't taken a snapshot in three days. So I can't go back anymore. So the idea is just take a lot of snapshots. Take a lot of snapshots and then you have a bunch of little points that you can go back to. The other idea is group your snapshots together in a logical sense. So if you do something like complete a new method that it took you a couple hours to write, maybe you should take a snapshot at that point. And then you can talk about your commit messages can be, you know, now my, now my program does this. Now my program does that, right? So commit early, commit often, take a lot of snapshots, okay? Um, don't wait till the end of the day to take your snapshot. Take it as you go. Every time you do something big, every time you do something meaningful in your code, take a snapshot. Okay, so I've got a bunch of changes here. Let's check out our status. Wow, very different. Okay, so we have changes that are not staged and are ready for commit. Changes, sorry, changes not staged for commit on tracked files. So this is what we saw the first time. These are brand new files that are, have never been marked as like, yeah, back these up, back these up, back these up, back these up, okay? Never marked. These are files that we had previously said, yes, back up, back up. We want to track this one. We want to track this one. Those check marks still exist, but it's telling me you've made some changes to them. One of them is modified, right? I add an extra line. And one of them was deleted, okay? One of them was deleted, one of them was modified. And I wanna see what those modifications were. There's a command for that. It's called diff. I type in diff and it shows me 
a really crazy representation of this change. Okay, it shows me the A's and the B's. And essentially it's saying, what this is saying is, see this little minus, this red? Red is removed. Green is added. Okay. So I can actually diff a specific file. I'm gonna diff this one, because you can only diff things that have changed. Both of these were changed and they've been tracked. And it shows me, this is what was removed, this is what was added. Technically, every time you change a line, that line gets removed and the new line gets added. And all I did was I added a little something to the line, but it's kind of treating it like the whole thing was removed, then the whole new one plus a little bit of stuff was added. Okay, so minus means minus red means removed, plus green means added. Don't worry about the rest of this stuff. You'll figure that out later. And this is a little hint. Now that the terminal's gone, I probably need to hit Q to get out of here. Okay, and then if I look at sample.js, And bigger said unknown revision or path in the working tree. Okay, we'll just do git diff. I don't know why that's doing that. Oh, because I guess it's not there. Um, sample. So if I just do git diff, it shows me all the disks for all the files. Okay, using less. This is I'm in less right now, which is why it's waiting for commands. Space will allow me to keep going. It shows, what did I do to sample? I deleted the file. So I essentially deleted minus, 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 minus all this code that was inside. Run status again. So that's what these are. So these are like, hey, you've made changes. So there's a couple things here going on. One, although I've already indicated that I want these tracked, I still need to tell it now Okay, I told you before I want these backed up, but now I need to tell Git now back up these new changes. So I still need to add these. Index. And sample. Okay, so I need to say when I push the backup button, I know you already know that I want these files backed up but you don't know that I want these new changes backed up. So that's what I'm telling it now. So those changes are not staged. So now these changes are staged. The fact that I deleted this, the fact that I modified it. Okay, those changes are staged, they're ready. So, cause I'm gonna do this again, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna create another one of these. It doesn't know though, like, so I did work, I did a bunch of work, on here, it didn't know that I was ready to say like, okay, I'm gonna bundle this work up and take a snapshot. So that's what add does as well. In addition, it also tracks all those files. And you could do wildcarding, so I can do this. Git add star dot txt. And now I was able to track all those new files. And now I'm ready for commit again. Okay. All right. So in addition to this, this one red file that's been driving me crazy, I need to get rid of. I wanna get rid of it permanently. Now, there is always going to be files that you don't wanna share that you don't want to share with other people, that you don't want backed up, you don't want tracked, and that's fine. That doesn't mean you want them deleted from your system. I don't know what this desktop INI file does. I don't want to take it away. What if my computer crashes? So instead, I'm going to tell Git, never ask about this file again, okay? Just ignore this file forever, okay? Keep it in the system, but never back it up, never ask me what I want to do with it, 
I don't care. Consider it out, out of the picture. So to do that, we need to create a new file called git dot git ignore. And inside this file, we put names and paths to other files that we don't want Git to track. So I'm gonna create, actually I'm not gonna to touch it, I'm not gonna create it, I'm gonna create it like this. I'm gonna echo the name of the file into Git ignore. Uh, what's the file name? Desktop.ini. And I'm gonna pump that into a new file called Git ignore. And if I look here, I see Git ignore is in there. Okay. And if I look at the Git ignore file, if I output it, all it contains is one line and the one line is desktop.ini. That's it. It's, it's a set of files line by line that represent paths to files. So I can ignore more files than just one. I can ignore many files. Okay. And there's their paths to files. It also accepts wildcards and stars. So like I could ignore all the dot txt files if I wanted to. Okay. So I added this new file, git ignore, which will allow me to permanently ignore files. So git doesn't ask about them anymore. And now when I say git status, that file, that desktop.ini file is gone but this new file is now there, git ignore, okay? And we do want to track this because this is going to be saying, this is always going to contain that information about which files we don't want. So we're going to git add. I'm gonna show you a trick to add many files at once. Actually, first I'm going to git um, remove dash dash cache html1.txt status. So we brought that one back out. I'm gonna show you how to add multiple files at once. So I already showed you, you can add multiple, two files at a time just with their names, or we can do a star.txt, but you can also do this, git add dot. And it's essentially adding everything that's not been added. This is a really heavy handed approach though, because it's not, you don't have control. It just adds everything that hasn't been added. And now everything's added and ready for commit. Sometimes when you're committing, you don't want to bring up the big browser thing or the big VS code with all that stuff. You just want to put a simple message in. You can do that with the dash M Space, and then a message. And enter. And the backup happens. The commit happens. So I've done two commits. Okay. Um, to add to commits, I've added the git ignore. Now we look at my git status. On branch master, nothing to commit, working tree clean. So that desktop.ini file, it's not gone. It's still here. It's just git totally ignores it. I can go and make changes to it. I can remove it. I can do whatever. Git doesn't care. It doesn't track that at all. It's like out of sight, out of mind. Okay, but it's still around. It's not backed up. Okay. So that is git add, git commit, git diff, and git ignore. On Monday, we're going to look how we can look back at all the commits that we have, right? Because like, you're probably wondering, okay, like where did this stuff go and what can I do with it? And the answer is you can't do anything with it yet, right? Just like yesterday, we just prep things. So we just, again, we just took another step forward. We just prep things. So now what I'm going to get you to do is I'm going to get you to follow a very specific set of instructions 
And then I'm going to add some additional instructions um, right away to just get you to go and add those projects that you initialized yesterday. I'm going to get you to go and commit all those files. Okay. So any questions here? Anything that you want me to cover again or review? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. So can you go a little bit up to, to your previous comments, like the echo, echo things? Like, do you echo the yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, stuff? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why there is a single code over uh, after, uh, like, after the echo? Oh, oh, I didn't need to. I didn't need to. Um, because echo, so like, I could have done this echo desktop dot ini into um, dot git ignore. I could have done no quotes and that would have worked fine because there's no spaces in that word desktop to I and I, I just, oh, okay. I'm just really used to echoing with quotes. Um, that's all. Oh, okay. That good question. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, one question is, yeah. um, so since you already added all the files to, um, your, uh, repo and uh -huh. uh, uh, if i modify a couple files so i can also use um git add dot to yeah yeah here so we'll echo uh something out to uh html1.txt and then we'll echo something out to html2.txt just to change them and if we do a git status those files change right We'll do git add dot, yep. And then status, and they're back, they're added. So I added them all, now I do git commit. Um, added something special to the files. Yeah, and then I have muscle memory. I've done, I ran these commands. I've been running these commands for 10 years, All right? So I'm really fast at it. I know, I know what's going on. It's going to take time for you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you, you use a uh, gate at dot. Uh, yeah. If the file uh, changed, that will yeah. add it to the tag. Yeah, so I, these were modified. So they weren't new, they were modified. Git add dot adds everything. Changed files, new files, removed files, everything. Yeah. If anything that is unstaged, so anything red, it will add. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at the exercise. So the exercise for this weekend um, is pretty straightforward. Think about it. Yeah, that's one. So um, it's like a very structured, the first question is just super structured, part one. Just very structured, go do this, make that, make a new file commit these, do this in one command, that kind of thing like I was doing for bash. Okay, but part two, actually, I need to pop back into class four. Part two is supposed to be, which I wanted to make it, take these three, um, take these three, Go to your budget calculator um, and add and commit all the files, right? If yesterday you initialized a new Git repository, go back there, add and commit all the files. Give, play around, play around with different ways of adding the files and committing the files. And that out. OK. 
Okay, and we're going to say the same thing for all three. I know you do it once, you do it a thousand times, but it's all about muscle memory. You got to do it a million times. You have to, you have to get for 10,000 hours. Okay. And all we have is 50. I got to make you experts in 50, not 10,000 hours. Okay. So there we go. Okay. So you're going to go the first one, you're going to make a new repository. You're going to add some files. You're going to modify the git ignore. The second part, you're just going to go to these other things, uh, these other repositories you already created, and you're going to add it. Okay, and actually, part of what we're doing, well, the reason why we're doing two things at once is because um, your exercise also, or so create a new repository for this weekend's exercise in SD140 and commit frequently. Okay, so practice this weekend while you're doing your exercise in the other course and commit early and commit often. Now, it's not gonna mean anything to you, okay? But trust me, the practice will pay off. And then on Monday, I'll show you how and why this is so important, why this concept of committing, adding and committing early and adding and committing often is really important because we're going to be able to look back and we're going to be able to actually step back into older versions of our code okay, and see all the changes that were made. Okay, so trust me. So in addition, uh, you, have, you have this weekend's exercise, which is just that there's only going to be two files, but you're going to be changing those two files often. So every hour, every hour that you're working, just commit them. Let's just add that as a little note so you remember. Okay. Remember to add. Okay, you can't just commit. You need to add and commit every time. Every time you need to add and commit. Two steps. Com get status. Get add, get status, get commit. Okay, status is not required, but it's helpful because you need to know what, what you're doing. Any other questions? Okay, so we're good now. We're done. We're done for the day. It's Friday. It's not raining, and it's like pretty nice outside. So. Maybe sit on your patio, sit on your uh, balcony, sit in the grass, the, the, the grass that's dry, and bring your laptop and just chill with a cup of coffee or a cup of something because we're done for the weekend. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, I will. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. um... Well, what's the uh, git diff means? I find uh, when I uh, code in my computer, it doesn't work. I have no response. It only works if some of the files have changed and they are not committed and not added. So git diff, so only when some of these files, let me add something to some of these files, like this one. Okay, so here, first of all, let me not do anything and let me just run git diff. Nothing, right? Because nothing has changed since if I go to git status, it's directly tied to that. So right, like git status shows no changes. No files have changed, no new files. But as soon as I do something like this, like change a file, and then I do get status and I see, oh, something's changed. Oh shit, what changed on there? Get diff. This was removed, this was added. This is what changed. Okay, oh yeah, I remember doing that. Okay, get add dot. Get commit. Made that change. I was asked to make by the boss. That's not a good commit message, by the way. 
And now if I do a get diff again, nothing shows up because it only shows the things that have not yet been added that have changed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just pausing. Any more questions? Okay, excellent. So let's call it a day. Um, I'll be around. I hope you're around. You've got some work to do. Uh, ideally, do it between now and 315 while you have tremendous access to me and Zach. After that, access will be limited, okay, as usual. So um, good luck. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you Monday. May the 4th, yeah, Star Wars Day. I don't really care, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Trekkie, so. But I'll see you then anyways. I'll see you guys later, have a great weekend. Have a great weekend.